Good morning. Welcome to Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mantian. Here at Expert Insights, we take external views of internal successes by foreigners, expats, and immigrants who have made Philippines their home to find out how good they are doing in the Philippines, either in society or business. This morning, this Friday morning, we have a very special guest. As usual, we have special guests. Uh, this gentleman is part Filipino and part Mexican. And he represents the country, the lovely country of Mexico, the deputy uh, chief of commission and trade commissioner, Mr. Christian Clay Mendoza, who's been in the country for a little over than a year, but speaks Tagalog, <laughs> like a Tagalog person. Uh, so let's welcome him. Welcome to Expert Insights, sir. Raju, thank you so much for having me on the show this morning. Oh, it's our pleasure, especially having a Mexican Filipino person. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, Philippines is my second home. Yeah. Actually, I'm I'm half Filipino, so so it's it's very nice to be able to serve as a bridge between yeah. my both beloved countries. It's not just home; it's part DNA. <laughs> that's true. It, it's that's DNA. true. Filipino blood runs in my veins. So, so uh, tell us a bit about your life growing up as a Filipino Mexican in Mexico, mostly in Mexico. And I'm going to add one more ingredient to that: a Filipino Mexican American, because my father was from the U.S. So so American oh, he was father. Mexican American. <laughs> Um, American father, Filipino mother, born in Mexico, raised oh, in Mexico, oh. uh, but with close contacts in all three countries, coming to Manila every summer for our holidays, so uh, trying to really... So would your dad be the person who was referred to as Yankee? Uh, uh, they, they would, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, sometimes a little bit derogatory, but he always took it in stride, so he, he loved uh -huh. Mexico very much and uh -huh. decided to settle there. Are the f is the family still around in Mexico? My mother and sister still live there in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the curious thing now is that my mother lives in the city where I was born, and I live in the city where she was born. And dad? So my father's passed away since then. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Okay, yes. fine. So uh, now tell us a bit about uh, life in the Philippines, a year and a half in the country of your DNA, mom's side DNA. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. I've been with the Mexican Foreign Service for about 15 years now, and uh, for 10 of those years, I was requesting to come to Manila because really? I, 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 you know, I kept telling the the Mexican government that I know the culture here, I know yeah. the people, yeah. and I can serve. Uh, I would like to be able to serve as some sort of a bridge or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they finally listened to me, and uh, I'm here working at the at the embassy with Ambassador Tomas Calvillo. Uh, we have many projects go ongoing right now. And we want to uh, show to our Filipino friends and hosts the closeness that our two countries have mm. uh, with each other. Amazing. So the, you, you, you're kind of choosing your identity. It must be very exciting for you inside to be doing what you want and to, uh, uh, be, to really be that, what you want to create. It's amazing. It is. It is. Yeah. It's very interesting indeed. And, and there's, you know, there's a sense of belonging when yeah. I'm here. There's a sense of belonging when I'm, when I'm yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. Um, and so what better job than to work for the benefit of both, yeah, yeah. Of both I, countries I must share becoming this. closer? I must share this. Uh, I've been in this country for 32 years. And for a while, I chaired the Filipino Indian Business Council. And mm. I used to say the same thing that you're saying, yeah. <laughs> that I'm the bridge, I'm the bridge, I'm the bridge. Yes. Use me, you know? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. One likes to think of that. And, and anything that we can do to help uh, promote friendships and to help promote partnerships, I think, is a positive thing. So uh, before, uh, sir, before we go into like, what's happening today, currently between Mexico and Philippines and what the potential line, uh, maybe you want to <coughs> go back into the history of Mexico and Philippines because I do believe that there was a long term relationship we had before. Do you want to share something? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. There was indeed. Um, although this year we are celebrating the 60 years of official diplomatic relationships between mm. Mexico and the Philippines, yeah. uh, which began in 1953, yeah. 14th of April to be exact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our friendship goes way, way, way back uh, to, to the Spanish colonial times. And uh, Mexico, being a colony of Spain at the time, mm -hmm. participated in the discovery and in the colonizing of the Philippines. Uh, most of the ships that came from Spain actually left from Mexico mm -hmm. with many Mexicans in them that came to settle here mm -hmm. and to share their culture and their values here. Many Filipinos then went back to Mexico mm -hmm. and settled there. 16th century. And 17th century. We're talking about the middle of the 16th century right. and this went on for 250 years. Once Whoa. they found the route 
uh, that could bring the, the galleons from Acapulco to Manila and back from Manila to Acapulco. Right. Yeah. This trade relationship began between right. Asia, the Americas, and Europe. This is the first uh, globalization, so was, one of the first... This was prior uh, to Columbus. This is, no, this is after. After Columbus. This is after. So after he, he discovers, quote unquote, the Americas in 1492. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the mid-1500s, 1521, Mexico is conquered yeah. and colonized. And, yeah. uh, and then a few years after, they, they come to the Philippines. The Philippines is, again, discovered, quote unquote, by Magellan. Yeah. Um, but then it is from Mexico that the first Spaniards actually come to the Philippines to settle in the country. Wow. And Legaspi, who was really the first colonizer of the Philippines, he yeah. was Spanish, but he was the mayor of Mexico City. Yeah. And from Mexico City, he was requested to come to the Philippines <laughs> and set up a government here. Yeah. So, so that bond, that closeness between our two nations translated into cultural exchanges, people-to-people -people right. exchanges, and of course, a lot of commodities and things that from Asia went to Mexico and, and, and Europe and vice versa. Certain habits, certain rituals, certain belief systems, quite similar between the Philippines and Mexico. My Filipino friends are always amazed when they go to Mexico and they say, oh my God, we do exactly the this same thing country. in the Philippines. <laughs> you know, we have these traditions, we do it this way. Yeah. And then Mexicans come to the Philippines and they said, my goodness, I feel right at home with all the traditions, the, the whole religious aspect of life uh, yeah. and a lot of the cultural experiences as well. Yeah. There, was, there was another uh, uh, gentleman, another traveler, Amerigo Vespucci. I don't know, was he Spanish, Italian, Portuguese? I believe he was Italian. Yeah. And I believe that the American continent was named after him. Mm. But he played no part in this triangle between Spain I and Mexico. I don't believe that he ever came out here, mm. but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. He might have had a side trip somewhere. So today, <laughs> two, two, three, four hundred years later, uh, even though we seemingly look alike, there must be some differences in terms of economy, in terms of uh, the impression of America and Mexico. What are the differences, if any, in, besides the language? Yeah, the differences are few. Language-wise, yeah. we kept uh, Spanish as yeah. our national language. Mm -hmm. um, the Philippines, because of the American influence here, because of the 50 years of Commonwealth uh, period, mm -hmm. adopted English yeah. as, their, as their main means yeah. of communication, aside right. from the national language, which is Filipino, and then all the regional languages. They retain some of the native uh, elements of the Malay language. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's quite sad that the Philippines lost Spanish mm -hmm. uh, because I think Spanish is a language that connects many, many nations. There's uh, at least 35 nations that speak Spanish as their official language and I think it would be a big boost if the Philippines were to retake mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish language. You think so? You think uh, so? Yeah. I think it would be very positive. Um, mm -hmm. And up to 15 or 20 years ago, you needed to know Spanish in order to enter college uh, here in, in the Philippines. In this country? Yes. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So uh, it still played an important role here. But it's been uh, fading away. Oh. Uh, we're trying now, together with other embassies, the Embassy of Spain, the Cervantes Institute, to bring it back, to bring a renewed interest I in... I had no uh, idea, 15, 20 years ago? In, in Spanish. I think uh, not. It's, it's only in the, in the, in the yeah. near mm. past that the Spanish was completely taken Wiped out of the curriculum. But um, aside from that, I think there's many more similarities than, than differences. Now, mm. our relationship was truncated because Mexico's independence preceded the Philippines' independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and once we became independent in 1821, uh, s uh, the Spain directly administered the Philippines. Spain had administered the Philippines via Mexico hmm. for those right, first right, 333 right, 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 right. years. Yeah. For the last 80 years, Spain administered the Philippines directly. directly yeah. We cut all links with, uh, with Spain and we became an independent country and that brought us apart for a while. Mm -hmm. Then the Philippines uh, became part of the, of the Commonwealth. We started having approaches. Uh, we had an honorary consul here in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. But it's really in 1953 that we formalize mm -hmm. diplomatic relations again. But I like to differentiate formal diplomatic relations in 1953 from friendship 500 prior years to that, ago. Prior to that. Uh, we'll take a break quickly you know, for Very the well. commercials. But I want to ask you this. I do know that there was a certain archbishop who influenced, or not really influenced, who wished freedom for the Filipino. Would you know of him or would you know of the spirit that surrounded that statement? I think the spirit that surrounded that statement was a movement uh, yeah. begun in many of the Spanish colonies, right. strangely enough, by 
uh, criollos, we call them in Mexico. Criollos, criollos. Or Mexicans uh, born of Spanish families, Spanish people whose children were already oh, born those in are, the colony. How do you say that, criollos? Criollo in Spanish. Criollo? Criollo, yeah, which, oh. is, which is a creole. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that just means that, that the parents came from the motherland, Spain, yeah. but the children were already born in the, in the oh, colonized country. Second generation of And they, they sort of adopt a love for their colonized country and they wish for that country to be ah. free, to be independent, to be sovereign, and I think this was a movement throughout many of the, of the colonies mm. at the time. That was it. So, let's take a little break, then we'll come back and talk to you about what is happening today, this current century between Philippines and Mexico. Very okay? well. So, let's take that break and we'll come back and talk to Christian Clay Mendoza, the Deputy Trade Commissioner of Mexico. I'm your host, Raju Mandi, and stay watching. Welcome back to Expat Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mandian. We are with Mr. Christian Clay Mendoza, part, uh, part Mexican, part Filipino. And he gave us a little bit of history and the culture of Mexico and Philippines. And now, uh, let's ask him about what is happening as of today between Mexico and Philippines. So, sir, tell us, where are we today? You are how many million people? We're, we're 110 million. Oh, you beat Mexico. us. Mexico, we beat you by a little bit. Yeah, okay. But uh, very similar, very similar. Beat us, well, I mean, Filipinos, and, uh, you know? Uh, yes. I'm us. <laughs> <laughs> we, we beat you, the Mumbai's. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's true, that's yeah. true. But yeah, we're 110. Um, what's going on right now, I believe, is very, very positive because the economies of both our countries are growing. Mm -hmm. Thank both you. our countries have initiated a number of economic and commercial trade reforms uh, aimed at modernizing our trade relationships, at uh, making them more efficient, at making less paperwork, less bureaucracy, and making it easier for people-to-people -people contacts, for mm -hmm. contacts between businessmen. And I think that this is, and businesswomen, sorry. Yeah, I business believe people. <laughs> business people. Yeah. I believe that this is a very, very positive moment for, yeah. for both, both our countries. Yeah. Now, if I may say so, yeah. I think that uh, uh, Mexico is the best bridge for Filipino businesses to use as a, a, a trampoline for the rest of the American continent, mm -hmm. North America, mm -hmm. South, Latin America. Yeah. Uh, Likewise, yeah, okay. sorry, okay. I believe that the Philippines is the best bridge for Mexican companies to come and settle here and use the Philippines as a base to uh, look at Exploration. the whole Southeast Asia, okay, okay. Asian region. Uh, great, so it's a long bridge, Mexico and Philippines, in terms <laughs> of distance, you know, not in yes. terms of accessibility and communication nowadays, but the distance and the, uh, is pretty big. But my question is that you said that trade reforms are being improved or reformed, no? Uh, any example that you might cite of before and after in any uh, aspect of trade between the two countries that was before and now is different? What has changed? Both, both of our countries went through a period there in the 60s and 70s yeah. where it was considered that the countries wanted to produce their own goods, wanted to be self-sufficient, right, right, uh, right. and trade was not favored as much. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to form our own companies. When the right. companies weren't born in the countries, the governments formed those right, companies, right. sort of forcing the situation. Right, right. Uh, com uh, government owned companies become very inefficient. Yeah, they, they become, become uh, giant not very, slots. Yeah. Not very competitive, monopolistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't allow for the free market to flow. This has changed now in both countries where a free market is being given much more margin to, to maneuver. And I believe that this is being translated into more jobs, into more revenue for both yeah, countries. More I think this was true for all, all nations, not just Philippines and Mexico, because I think this was true for even America, even they had these trade barriers or these tariffs which protected uh, transfer of goods, transfer of people, transfer of investments. Now most countries are opening up, like Chile, Argentina, Brazil, or here in the East, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have all opened up. So this is true, no? Uh, any, any specific reforms in the Philippines that are helping investments from Mexico's? from Mexico to Philippines? Well, the Philippines have uh, initiated a number of reforms aimed at simplifying foreign direct investment coming here. Yeah. Um, and that has been very good and that has yeah. been eyed by a few Mexican companies right. who, mm -hmm. are, who are looking into the Philippines, a couple of them who have already come in. Mm -hmm. um, we have done the same in Mexico. We've, mm -hmm. we've simplified many, many trade barriers. Mm -hmm. um, we have also signed a number of free trade agreements mm -hmm. with many countries. 
which means that if a Filipino business manufacturers in Mexico follow certain rules about uh, using some components that have to be from one of the countries that we have an yeah, FTA yeah. with, the local et cetera, et cetera. Add, yeah. um, then they are able to sell mm -hmm. to the whole region. And so I, I would like yeah. you to, if you don't mind, show this uh, uh, slide yeah. to our dear viewers. This is the potentiality of Mexico and the rest of so Latin America. No, this is only our North American Free Trade Agreement, which was the first one that we signed in 1994. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this free trade agreement allows for free trade between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Yeah. Um, and this gives you a potential of 500 million consumers. So a Filipino doing you know, manufacturing in Mexico will not only have to sell in Mexico, he can sell his products to all these countries. This doesn't include USA and Canada. It does. It does it include. Does. Wow. It and does. how about Brazil? It does. So we have other free trade agreements. Yeah. And now, if you don't mind showing this, this one. This is to the our second set of opportunities. To our viewers. We've right. now, after NAFTA, we signed another 12 free trade agreements with a total of 44 countries. Yeah. And uh, this, these free trade agreements uh, uh, comprise more than 60% of worldwide GDP. Yeah. Um, and here you have one billion potential consumers. So it is very attractive to set up a business uh, in Mexico, in Mexico where, mm -hmm. where our labor costs are a little bit lower, but they're very, very qualified, and then be able to sell it, expand your market to the whole American continent. I think uh, that's a huge opportunity there for Filipino businesses. Yeah. So two questions before I forget the first one. The first one was, of course, the second one is more important, but the first one is any uh, success stories between Philippines and Mexico or Mexico and Philippines in terms of Filipinos investing in Mexico? Any industry, you want to name something? Well, we have, we have uh, an important Philippine company uh, involved in port management, mm -hmm. and uh, they are actually now managing one of our most important ports in Mexico, container ports. This is a 100% Pinoy company? Uh, this is a Pinoy company. I'm yeah. speaking of ICTSI. Right, right. Um, and they have this, this important investment in Mexico, an important partnership with, wow. with Mexico. Our ports used to be off limits to foreigners. There's another one of those reforms where we've opened up and said, okay, come invest. That, that's a sensitive manage. thing to allow foreigners to take over. Well, I think it is. I yeah. think th the, the best person should be able to take over no matter where they're from. Oh, the most qualified. You know, the most qualified, yeah. the most competitive, yeah. and that will push your local people to say, all right, I'm going to become more competitive so I can also have right, what, right. He, what he has. So that's a service industry. But I, I believe yeah. that is a service provider, yeah. it's a container port, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we have two Mexican companies who have uh, invested uh, uh, in the Philippines, and we're, we're very, very happy and very proud, proud. of them. Yeah. And uh, they, they seem to be doing very well here, and we're, we're very, very happy about what, that. What industry are the, they? The first one is in the cement industry. Yeah. And uh, Cemex is yeah. the most important Mexican cement company and mm -hmm. one of the most important cement companies around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe they currently uh, rank number two in the Philippines. They've been here for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, providing cement to the construction companies, etc. The most important thing is that not only do they have operations in the Philippines, but they've decided to make Manila their headquarters for all of Asia. Mm -hmm. This is a hundred person Mexican company. It is. Born and raised in Mexico. Born and raised yeah. in Mexico, Monterrey, our industrial city in the northeast of the country, yeah. Yeah. where this company hails from. Yeah. Um, and making Manila their headquarters is a vote of confidence in what the Philippines is doing, they love the Philippine route Philippine. that the Philippines is taking, the changes, the reforms, the transformations. In the 10 years they have grown? In the 10 years they have grown. And they, they have, have reinvested uh, all their growth back into the Philippines? I believe they continue to reinvest here and to use this as a platform for their sales throughout Asia. Prior to 10 years before Semex, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very conversant with the industry, but I thought there were a lot of uh, low value, uh, low grade imports which was not positive for the country. Has Semex impacted that, corrected that uh, situation, if you're aware of it? I, I would like to say yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, no, definitely. of course, I mean, is that factually, yes? 
Uh, and I, I believe factually it is true. I believe yeah. the quality of the products has now gone up. Yeah. Uh, not only uh, because these companies have very, very high quality products, but because also the government of the Philippines has realized that there need to be certain standards, international standards, and they're meeting them now. And mm. the construction industry in the Philippines has now become very, very competitive. Yeah, it's growing so much. Yes. It's growing so much, yeah. yes. What about the other one? You mentioned there's one more. And the other big company that just uh, arrived in the Philippines very recently is a, another big conglomerate from Monterrey in Mexico. They're called FEMSA. Right. Uh, we're very, very proud of this, of this uh, Mexican uh, company because mm -hmm. they've, they've uh, become very international and they've gone into a number of international markets, etc. Um, and FEMSA is now participating in Coca-Cola mm -hmm. here in the Philippines. I don't mean to make any commercials. I am obviously yeah. uh, in favor of all companies. I know companies you, you did offer business. free Coke to everyone <laughs> one time. <laughs> but uh, but uh, FEMSA is, is now present here in the Philippines. We're very happy for that. We wish them all the success. And we believe that they're going to add value and competitiveness to the local market. So this is a very proud moment for Mexicans and Mexico as a nation, no? to play such a big part in global economics and global business. Well, to see our companies for the first time, uh, you know, in the last only yeah, 10, no, 15 buy years, out stuff. our companies have started uh, becoming international conglomerates. Yeah. Um, and this is indeed, uh, we're very proud of that because it speaks of administration, it speaks of uh, vision, the strategy, that strategies, yeah. etc. And I, I think it's a very positive thing. So that's my question. Uh, many years ago, uh, I'm a little gray now, no? so I have some experience. I was in Latin America, and there was this uh, humorous story that used to go around about Mexicans' economy before the loan by the Clinton administration, that uh, the, the time you pick up your salary and before you step out of your office, it becomes devalued, and you need to really run to the exchange rate and save your <laughs> money and save the purchase power <coughs> parity of that uh, income that you generated. What has Mexico done right in the last 15, 20 years? What were the action steps they took that many other nations who have suffered the same thing have not been able to do? Would you highlight it for us? Because that, I think that's the value we want to know. We want to be able to implement. What have what has Mexico, Mexico done right? Well, I believe, I believe there's a number of experiences here. Yeah. Um, it used to be that our economy was not only very, very tied to the United States, which is kind of natural. Dependent, you mean? We, we share a 3,000 kilometer border. When you border. say tied, you mean dependent on Mexico? Well, I wouldn't like to use that word, but in, in a certain sense, perhaps, yeah. 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 there was a, a little bit of dependency there. Mm -hmm. um, more than 80% of our trade was with the United States. Right. A big right. chunk of it still is now, but we've diversified. We've right. diversified. We, uh, our main source of income used to be the export of oil right. and so our economy depended on the price of oil and on the, the on the on the in, on the demand for oil and so when demand From was America. low we would we would suffer when yeah. demand was high we would have a boom time right. and we'd constantly be going up and down so you had a monopolistic customer you had one customer and for most of our there, goods yeah. and products. Right, um, okay. And we used to have this joke in Mexico that when the United States coughed, we would catch pneumonia. <laughs> you know, just a little cough from okay. them was a big pneumonia for us because their economy is so huge. Yeah, yeah. Ours was, was a lot smaller. Every time they sneezed, you went to the hospital. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And now what's happening is that, is that they are sneezing and they're getting the bad cold and right. we are uh, keeping our heads up high. What happened? Well, yeah. These reforms that I was telling you about, yeah. liberalizing trade, yeah. diversifying. Mm -hmm. We don't only depend on oil now. In fact, in one of these things that I was, uh, one of these things that I brought here, yeah. a, a majority of our exports, you will see there, came from non-oil exports. Right. So we've been, we've become big in services. We've become very big in manufacturing. Yeah. We have diversified. We've also now learned to save. Our reserves are a lot higher. Mm -hmm. uh, we reformed our banking system way before the 2008 crisis that hit the United States, mm -hmm. the European Union, and the rest of the world. We were already, we were hit by a really bad crisis in 1994. You spoke of the Clinton loan, which, yeah. by the way, we never used. It was uh, just a guarantee. I know it was, yeah, it returned you know. very quickly. Uh, at that point, we realized we needed to reform our banking and fiscal system to make it much more conservative. Uh, we did so for the last 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. and this allowed us to not be hardly affected by the 2008 Any crisis. Any specific individual or hero of that time, an economic or financial genius who 
created this for you? For well, I, I think there were a number of them. Yeah. A number of our finance ministers during that time uh, yeah. realized that we needed to, to, to move ahead mm -hmm. and that we needed to reform, we needed to modernize, we needed to become more efficient, we needed to invite foreign direct investment mm -hmm. into the country. So today, the country, Mexico, uh, per capita income, the lifestyle of every individual in Mexico, how much has that changed, sir, in the last? 15 years. Uh, just in the last year alone, we grew 3.7 percent, mm -hmm. uh, which is less than the 6.1 That's G percent GDP. Yeah. GDP. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Philippines had a wonderful growth uh, in, 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 in 2012, 6.1, I believe, yeah. or 6.6, uh, which is really, really great and, mm -hmm. and laudable. Ours was 3.7. If you consider, once again, that our border with the United States, that our major trading partners in the United States, and that they've been going through a rough period. Uh, economically speaking, okay, yeah, because our yeah, growth yeah. of 3.7 is former big customer. not. Your former big and still, still, yeah, most yeah. of our trade is still with the United yeah. States. They're our major trading partner. Uh, but thanks to diversification and, and, and making it easier for foreign companies to come to Mexico and manufacture, we've been able to maintain growth. We've been able to maintain our exchange rate. We've been able to grow our reserves mm -hmm. of foreign capital. Um, and this has allowed for a lot of stability in the economic uh, so the lifestyle and the living of a single family or an individual in Mexico, uh, how different has it become now? Uh, well, what, the what does the streets of Mexico look like compared to 15 years ago, 20 years ago? A lot of investment in infrastructure, and yeah. so, so finally we were able to, to modernize some of our streets to get the second, uh, second skyways, level uh, skyways, etc. <laughs> uh, in Mexico, we, we have a long way to go. It's still, yeah. it's still, some places still need a lot of work, but we've been able to advance a lot in that. I think the most important thing is the growth of the middle class mm. in Mexico. And we used to have this situation with, with a, a tiny percentage of the population controlling 90% of the economy, and, and then a huge mean? percent of the population population controlling nothing yeah. and a very small middle class. That middle class has now been growing. Those people who had nothing now have a little house and a little wow. car and a little business. And, and this is the way we'd like to continue to go. So there are uh, currently 200,000 approximately from what the reports say, 200,000 Filipinos in Mexico. Different jobs. I'm assuming, I'm not sure if this uh, information is true. So I the don't question have is, what I are they doing? I don't yeah. have the exact number. Now, I believe that yeah. those 200,000 include... That's a lot. It's, it's a lot of people. I yeah. believe that it includes Mexican Filipinos. That is, Mexicans who have Filipino Traces origins. Of, yeah. But they're already Mexicans living there, making yeah. their life there, etc. Uh, uh, the, the real number of Filipino citizens living and working in Mexico, I believe, is much less than that. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's growing. It's growing. And mm -hmm. uh, at the embassy, most of the visas that we, that we uh, uh, process are for uh, Filipino sailors. And we all mm -hmm. know that Filipino so sailors are very, very good. And they, they offer a wonders, wonderful service. And most of international maritime uh, transactions are done with Filipino mm -hmm. sailors. And we have a lot of them coming to Mexico and boarding their ships Because there. it's also a hub for lots of us. Uh, it's a hub for different yeah. ships going, going all throughout Latin America and uh, to Europe. Et so uh, I, if I'm a Filipino entrepreneur, yeah, what do I need to do? Uh, to set up business in Mexico. What are my incentives? And of course, what are my potentials? What, yeah, what do I do? Very well. Where yeah. di different regions in Mexico offer different incentives, tax incentives and mm -hmm. other types of incentives to foreign companies that come and invest there. So the first thing I would invite you to do as a Filipino businessman is to study a map of Mexico and right. to decide where is the best place for you to set up your business. What mm -hmm. are your interests? Are you mainly going to export to the U.S. and to Canada? Then you set up your business in one of our border towns yeah. uh, so that you'll have easy access, direct mm -hmm. access Land. To, yeah. to the United States and Canada. You will put your goods on a, on a bus yeah. and in a few hours you'll be distributing them in the United States and in Canada. Oh, Is okay. your interest another region of Mexico you come to? Then we have a number of industrial parks that specialize yeah. in different sectors. So if you're in the automotive industry, then yeah. I will invite you to a few industrial parts in a couple of mm -hmm. our states that specialize in the automotive industry that have cluster companies that will provide you mm -hmm. with all the, 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 the goods that you need to manufacture and assemble your product. How about equity, ownership, and uh, repatriation of funds? Uh, let's just pause there, okay? <laughs> let's just pause there. We'll take that question up after the break. No? Equity, Wonderful. ownership, repatriation. 
and uh, growth potentials right after the break. So let's take, take that break and come back and talk to Mr. Christian Clay Mendoza, who's very excited about inviting Filipinos to Mexico. Stay watching. This is Expat Insights. I'm your host, Raj Mandian. Welcome back to Expat Insights. I'm your host, Raj Mandian. We are talking to Mr. Christian Clay Mendoza, and we are really excited about the business potentials in Mexico and the trade between the two countries. So, sir, going back to the question for the camera, for the audience, equity ownership and uh, property ownership and repatriation of funds, uh, what is good about that? <laughs> <laughs> Mexico has become one of the most open countries in the right. world for foreign yeah. direct investment. And so you, you have full ownership. We do not meddle in that at all. We have a regulation about how many Mexicans we would like you to employ. Okay, what uh, is that? Because we had situations in the past where a foreign company would say, well, all right, I'm going to invest in Mexico, but I want all the employees to be from my country. Japanese. <laughs> and we said, we said, well, listen, we, we, we really want you to be able to have a spillover effect yeah, it creates to our Mexico. So, yeah. so we created this, this regulation whereby a certain percentage of your employees must be Mexican. The other percentage can be from wherever you want Which it to be. Which is 50% or and more? Uh, and it, it's a little bit more than that, and it varies yeah. also of by course. state Why and would by I import, uh, labor and, or and management, yeah. And by industry, but uh, but uh, aside from that, ownership is full. Repatriations of funds is completely open, uh, and and so uh, it is very very open in that sense. Ownership, if it's a, even if it's a domestic industry that's dependent on income generation domestically. Still 100% ownership, unlike Philippines, because Philippines, if you do business locally, yes, you if you're doing income generation, then you need to have a 60-40 percentage. But if you're 100% export oriented, then you exactly. can own it 100 percent. Yeah. For for many many years, we were we were 49-51. It had to be 51 percent Mexican, and it right. could only be 49 percent foreign. And or local. Or yes. Yeah. And we decided uh, against this. We decided that uh, we needed to promote competition. Right. Uh, competition is healthy. And a foreigner coming in and producing yeah, yeah. this glass yeah. uh, at a better, have the at a better and cheaper rules, rate rules, should yeah. have the exact same rules, yeah. and 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 it, it then behooves the Mexican to produce nice. the same glass even at yeah, a better price. Yeah. And this helps the consumer in the end. The consumer right. will be paying less. It helps the country. It helps the country. And yeah. it helps the country. Yeah. So we have abolished that law now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, land tenure can be 100% owned with a few exceptions that have to do so with national negative, security. Yes, yeah. So some areas around our coasts, mm -hmm. some areas very, very close to the border. There's some regulations. It's not completely regulated. You're able to lease it for 99 years. Mm -hmm. So we're still very, very open. But just a couple of things to take care of national security issues. Amazing. Good, sir. Thank you very much for all this information. No? So uh, let me ask you a bit. Let me bring this back to you now that you are the trade <laughs> commissioner. No? What do you plan to achieve? What's happening uh, that you are actively taking part in now? And I don't know when your term ends or maybe it'll never end because you're being Filipino. What do you plan <laughs> to achieve in the coming two or three years? I would like to see the relationship between Mexico and the Philippines become even closer mm -hmm. and grow even mm -hmm. more. The experiences of two Mexican companies investing in the Philippines mm -hmm. and one Filipino company investing in Mexico needs to be multiplied. Okay. We need to let more people know yeah. about this. We need also to give them the certain guarantees that they might require, especially medium and small sized companies. Yeah, right. They're going to want to have some guarantees. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. invest in your country, but mm. I want to have an assurance that my, the ones who are more fragile. my investment will be yeah. protected. You yeah. know? Um, and so we, uh, the two governments, Mexico and the Philippines, are now talking to perhaps form a joint commission and study mm. uh, the relationship every year, get together, study what do we need, mm -hmm. uh, what judicial uh, agreements do we need to come into in order to facilitate business between our two peoples. Mm -hmm. So I would like that to become consolidated. I would mm -hmm. like us to have a framework, a legal framework, whereby a businessman will say, I trust my investment in, in that country. both the countries, both ways. In both huh? of those countries. So, what's your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, what, what, what's a day in the life of Mr. Mendoza? 
here in the Philippines? Well, at the, at the embassy, we... Besides, we, of course, uh, doing expat sites. We Exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is an important part of my day, I have to say. But, uh, no, at the embassy, we spend a lot of time speaking with uh, business people from the Philippines who are interested in Mexico. And so we tell them what opportunities there oh, are. Oh, so you cater to uh, uh, individual uh, needs. Yes, and it's mainly the medium and small-sized companies that approach us. Oh. The huge, huge companies, they, they don't they really need lawyers, too much help they from, have their from, big guns, from, yeah. from their embassies, right? Mm -hmm. But the medium and small-sized embassies, uh, sorry, companies do mm -hmm. need that assistance. Mm -hmm. We do the same for Mexican medium and small-sized companies. They will ask us, how can I invest in the Philippines? What do I need to do? What are the areas that I can go into? We like to provide them that information. We like right. to see ourselves as knocking at doors. We're not going to do the job for you, for the company. We are going to knock at doors, open doors for you. I need a meeting with these people from the Bureau of uh, Investments. I need a meeting here. We, we will facilitate that. Quickly, uh, sir, uh, what are the products, both ways, that uh, have potential? Philippines to Mexico for export and, from, of course, from... Mexico to Philippines import. What product? Uh, Philippines to Mexico, the first thing that comes to mind is agricultural products because yeah. the Philippines has such excellence in a number of agricultural products that yeah. they, could, uh, they could consider right. exporting not only to Mexico, but as I said before, to the whole right. region. So they could really consider uh, expanding stuff, the, the yeah. food industry, I believe, mm -hmm. is very important. The Philippines is very, very big now on the service industry. Right. Uh, and, and I believe that they, they are able to provide a number of, of services uh, to, to Mexican companies that would be very, very interesting to explore. Is, is Mexico on the horizon for outsourcing industry, just like India, Brazil, and, or it's not? It is. It yeah. is. It is also there, and mm -hmm. it's been doing a very, very good job. Mm. Uh, not as big as in India or, or in the Philippines, in yeah. fact. But we have been doing a very, very good job, and I think we could, we could exchange experiences there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, so that's that's another sector that could mm -hmm. be that could be explored. And then we have your more technical sector. So Mexico has uh, been pioneering in the very very specific parts of avionics, for example. Right. Uh, that and, and in the manufacturing sectors that we're right. able to to right. provide experiences and things to the Philippines. And then we have our government experiences, and this is where the embassy sort of comes in a little bit more. And so Mexico has installed a number of social policies to help this growth reach, oh, oh, oh. reach the people, you know. Right, right. Uh, and we're very interested for in exchanging example, this, for, this information. For example, for example. So, for example, there's a program in Mexico called Oportunidades, yeah. which has been analyzed by the Filipino side. Right. And the Filipino yeah. side is considering adopting some of the things from that program That's for small and with, their own, with their own. No, this is a social, a social oh, thing. Oh, okay. So Oportunidades gives financial assistance to mothers who keep their children in school. Whoa, okay, All sounds right? good, yeah. We have another one called Seguro Popular, a popular insurance. People who do not have money to pay for insurance, right. who do not have money to pay for hospitalization, the government gives them support uh, in order to have their health care right. covered. Basic health care for the poorest of the poor. So you are counseling the Philippine and government? And so we, we are talking to each other mm. about different experiences that we have in, in, in both of our countries and learning from each one of our experiences. Great, sir. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much for these insights. And uh, if I have forgotten to ask you anything about Mexico and Philippines, this is your time. I have one question, but uh, unless you don't want to answer that one. Uh, please, please. Go I ahead, just wanted to know uh, between Filipinos and Mexicans, who do you regard as better boxers? <laughs> <coughs> That's a very good question. That's, That's a very, very good question. question. I held it for the last. I think, I think uh, Filipino and Mexican boxers are very, very good, and their fans are very, very good. Right. We have people in both countries who adore the sport. Right. Uh, and so we, we create boxers of excellence. Now, the funny thing is that whenever a Filipino and a Mexican are going to box, and somebody asks me, well, who, <laughs> who would you like to win, you know, right. because you're sort of in the middle of the two. <laughs> and I always tell them diplomatically, whoever wins, I'm still happy. So, uh, uh, so uh, to justify that statement during the last uh, match, uh, who did you cheer for up until the fifth round? Let's just put it this way. I cheered for both of them. <laughs> I have to be diplomatic, my dear Raju. <laughs> So thank you so much. Thank and you, so I don't thank know how you, you say you. salamat in Mexican. Gracias. 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 Yeah. Yes. So thank you very much for this interview. And 
I like the fact that we had a triangle and Spain's gone, so that means it's just Philippines and Mexico. And I hope uh, trade grows and our cultural exchanges become better and we are the hub and maybe both shine and rise. The better we get to know each other, the more we're going to grow. Gracias, Senor. Thank you. So that was Christian Clay Mendoza, the Deputy Chief of Commission and Trade uh, Commissioner of Mexico in the Philippines. And you heard all that is happening between Mexico and Philippines and all that can happen. And if you ever want to get in touch with him, his office is just across the studio. And the website, of course, is www.mexico. That's it. That's it. Mexico.orps. So. Uh, thank you for watching Expat Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mandhya. Uh, next week on Expat Insights, we'll have a gentleman called uh, Jess Hastings, and he is a financial consultant putting up an outsource industry. So until next time, have a great week ahead of you. Good night and mabuhay. Thank you.